Some time ago in December 2013, there was this um, two-year-old boy in a little town called Gokedu. Gokedu is a small town in Guinea, and Guinea is very close to Sierra Leone and Liberia. This little boy had fever and later developed diarrhea, began to vomit, and in about a week, he was, you know, blood was coming out from different parts of his body. He died in less than two weeks, sadly. But his death did not stop there. Problem began to occur, and the, and the town began to think of it as a spell. Or some medical practitioners thought it was malaria. In about three months, a lot of stuff had happened in that town. People were going about the spell because, you know, it's a small town. People didn't get to know more about it. And before the samples got to WHO, it was discovered it was something else. This evil scourge did not stop in this small village. It got on boats, it got on, you know, porous borders, and new route, routes, you know, plane routes to different parts of Africa. And this scourge began to spread. And in less than three months, we had over 1,000 cases from different countries. On the 22nd of July, to be precise, I got a call from one of my professors, and he called and said, Ayo, we'll be expecting some samples from a doctor. And um, she called in, and um, they brought in the samples about 3 p.m. And she said, one of those samples is actually urine. And I said, no, it looks like blood. She said, no, it's urine. And by the time we went on, OK, this is a small town. OK, it's not on. Let's go on. And by the time, time we had the sample in 24 hours, we knew what we were working with. This is the small town, Gokedu, and we can see it close to Liberia and Sierra Leone. And in week one, you know, we can see, you know, the spread as it was going over time, week six, week seven, week eight, week nine, nothing was happening and the case was expanding. And by the time we got to about week 16, it thought as, as if it was dying. Week 18, people were traveling, they were having burial ceremonies, traditional medical uh, practitioners began to wash bodies. Those who moved to Sierra Leone, we can see Sierra Leone popping up as red and Liberia popping up as green due to transborder crossings, and this disease began to spread. But interestingly, it flew through Liberia to Ghana, from Ghana to Togo, and Togo came to Nigeria. But three months, nothing happened, and we can see all that happened in three months. Imagine if this had happened in Nigeria in three months. I don't think I'll be here standing today to talk to anybody. But thankfully for the heroic work of um, Dr. Stella Dadevo, who called that afternoon. <laughs> who called that afternoon and said, you guys have to do something about this. I suspect this is what the case is. I didn't know what the case was, but all I saw was three bloody samples. Three. I meant not bloody, bloody, you know, literally. And I was like, he said, no, one of them is urine, not blood. I said, this can't be possible. So that showed, you know, the level at which blood was coming out from different parts of the patient's body. 24 hours in Nigeria, we could get a result. How did we do this? You know, and we learned this from our Nigerian success story based on the resources that we had. Thankfully, we had the help of the WHO. My professor was a resource person. Um, those of us in the lab, we had support from the private organizations. At that point, again, we had technological competence. We had the PCR machines that could help us. And where this work was done, an academic environment. So that brings to bear that education and training is very important to nation's development. But how did you know what we had played with the night of 22nd of July 2014? How did we know in 24 hours? And that brings me to the fact that everything in life is a code. Everything. Codes have been written, and these codes are embedded in every cell. So once, if I can get your code, I can tell exactly who you are and what you are. So what we did that night was to open up the sample, open up in code, brought out the codes, sequenced the codes, and from the codes that we got, we could tell that we were working with Ebola. 
So what are these codes? Many times we call these codes the DNA. A lot of us have heard about DNA in um, paternity testing, thanks to criminal investigation or some sci-fi movies. But these codes actually are like the computer codes, like the binary codes. But just in binary codes, we have the 0, 1 system. But in the life codes, we have four letters, A, G, C, and T. And these codes have to be written in a unique fashion. And you know, if you're going to transcribe your binary codes in your computer, you're going to transcribe it to a secondary level language. I'm sorry, I'm not a computer scientist, but you can have programs like Fortran, BASIC, right? Then um, Bill Gates now used the, Fortran, um, the, the BASIC programming language to now develop the graphical user interface that we have today, the OS, the Windows system that all of us can interact with. The same thing with the codes of life. These codes are transcribed into a secondary level language, and later they form the proteins. These are the proteins that forms our hair, which we call keratin. They form our muscle mass. They form different parts of our hormones. They form transport proteins and some other parts. And this makes us exactly who we are. So what are we saying in essence is that this sequence determines our identity. We have seen how a little virus could devastate nations, could devastate towns, could cut short generations. How much more human beings? And when we look at our codes, the virus was about less than 20 kilo base pairs. You know what we are? We are about 3 billion base pairs of codes. 3 great billion. And out of the 3 billion, less than 1 point, about 1.5% 1 actually make the proteins, all the 30,000 proteins that we have. What about the 90, 98%? What are they doing? So that gives us an opportunity to keep exploring into this set of codes to develop drugs and do quite a number of things. So your identity and your codes matter a lot. So I'm just quickly, quickly going to talk about how these codes matter in healthcare. Part of healthcare was the Ebola story, the biotech industry, DNA identification when we talk about paternity testing, and a huge part that I love so much, unfortunately I'm not very good at it, is the data analytics. Under the healthcare, now a lot of cases of cancer are beginning to come up, and most of these cases are based on genetic instabilities, whether we like it or not. Our DNA also interacts with the environment, so as it's interacting with the environment, it may lead to some of the changes in the proteins I just talked about, and that might lead to some, you know, disease conditions. And another very good example is the case of diabetes mellitus, where, you know, we discover that you might, you would need insulin to treat diabetes. Of course. But where do we get this insulin from? It's from the pancreas, a very small organ somewhere here. And that means that you have to wait for someone to die to get your insulin. How many people are we going to wait for to die? So in the 70s, they would have to wait for cadaver, you know, purify the insulin. But that might not be enough to treat one person in a day. So they went on to animals. So you have to get insulin from animals. But today, you can get the codes that codes for insulin from humans and take it to the codes in E. coli, which is a bacteria, it's a very small organism, that can multiply the codes, you know, in large quantity overnight and can treat everybody in this hall for two weeks. Right. So that's the power of the codes. And when we look at DNA identification, very important. For national security, we can't do without it. Because if every criminal were to be profiled, it would be easy for you to look at crime scenes and say, oh, this person was here. Even if you don't know where the person is, you could actually trace that this person could be Yoruba, you know, could be Igbo, could be Aousa, could be anybody. And that could give you a very good close to where you're going to. And more so, it can also help in the case of remains identification. And you can also link your thumbprint with your DNA codes that, oh, you have it, oh, you're good. And we can know who exactly you are. Then when we move to the biotech industry, it's a big industry that is doing a whole lot in the world, and Nigeria is yet to tap into this industry. The last part I'd like to talk about is the data analytics. With your three billion base pairs, billion, if I have to sequence the code and work with the codes, it will fill my 150 gigabyte space of my computer. How am I on earth going to analyze that such kind of data? So that means I need a computer guy. I need the data guys, I need the mathematicians to help me to do this. And that brings about um, 
the area of the sequence. Let's just interact with this sequence in a very simple way. Sorry to bring you back to class a bit. We can see the case of sickle cell, where we have the red, the red letter, letter G. And if we look up, the letter corresponding to it, up where we have the normal beta chain, is the A, because this is the protein that makes part of our blood. We call it beta hemoglobin. Just a change in a single nucleotide from A to T has caused a major change and has caused the blood to be sickled and has caused a major problem. And when you see the red blood cell is round, but the sickle cell looks like sickle, sickle chip because of the single change in base, base that we have, and that leads to a lot of capillary blockage and most of the clinical symptoms that we find. And this is just the schematics of the production of insulin. And finally, this is a huge market that I feel a lot of young Nigerians should begin to look into. In this market, you can have the, the chemist coming in, you can have the biochemist, you can have the animal guys, the vet guys, you can have the medical doctors, you can have the, um, um, the activists who are, who, are, who are fighting against GMO foods, you can have the clerics in terms of ethics, you can have the lawyers, and you have the whole criminal justice system tapping into this market. I'd like to leave us with this, that out of all of this, where do we actually fit in? Thank you for your time.